a grim anniversary in Ukraine, met with a visit by the U.S. president and a vow of continued support. Democracy stands. The Americans stand with you and the world stands with you. Defending Ukraine from Russia's ambitions, now on the inside story, Ukraine one year later. Hi, I'm Carla Babb reporting in Washington, D.C., near Ukraine's embassy to the United States. It's been one year since Russia began its war against Ukraine. From the start, many expected Russia would capture the capital, Kyiv, within a matter of days. But Russia's military strength was overestimated, while Ukraine's defensive capabilities were underestimated. And NATO countries responded by arming Ukraine with defensive weapons to try to push back Russian advances. Russia continues to attack Ukraine with infantry and tanks on the ground and missiles from the skies. In the face of that threat this week, President Joe Biden made an unannounced visit to Kyiv as a show of solidarity. VOA White House correspondent Patsy Widikuswara starts us off. U.S. President Joe Biden on Tuesday returned to the royal castle in Warsaw, Poland, where he had delivered a speech last year, a month after Russia invaded Ukraine. In his latest speech, he defended the Western Alliance's effort to help Kyiv defend itself. One year ago, the world was bracing for the fall of Kyiv. Well, I've just come from a visit to Kyiv, and I can report Kyiv stands strong. Kyiv stands proud, it stands tall, and most important, it stands free. On the same day, Russian President Vladimir Putin spoke to an assembly of Russian lawmakers, saying the U.S. and NATO wants to inflict a strategic defeat on his country. He suspended participation in the New START Treaty, a landmark nuclear arms control pact, and threatened to resume nuclear tests. In early February of this year, the North Atlantic Alliance made a statement with a de facto demand on Russia, as they say, to return to the implementation of the Strategic Offensive Arms Treaty, including the admission of inspections to our nuclear defense facilities. Well, I don't even know what to call it. What a theater of the absurd. Speaking directly to Russian citizens, Biden stressed that the West is not the enemy. The West was not plotting to attack Russia as Putin said today. And millions of Russian citizens who only want to live in peace with their neighbors are not the enemy. This war is never a necessity. It's a tragedy. Biden reiterated what Vice President Kamala Harris announced days earlier at the Munich Security Conference, that the U.S. has determined Moscow has committed crimes against humanity against the Ukrainian people. Earlier Tuesday, Biden met with President Andrzej Duda, thanking him for Poland's support for Ukraine and assuring the NATO partner that Washington will respond if Russia launches an attack on Poland. Poland has welcomed more than 1.5 million Ukrainian refugees and provided billions of dollars in weapons and humanitarian assistance. The White House denied Moscow's claim that Biden received security guarantees from Russia before his surprise visit to Kyiv to meet with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky on Monday. Zelensky said the conversation brought joint victory. We can and we must do so that 2023 becomes the year of victory. Before returning to Washington on Wednesday, Biden will meet with NATO leaders from the so-called Bucharest 9, the countries on NATO's easternmost flank. Patsy Widakuswara, VOA News, Warsaw. As Russia's invasion of Ukraine approached a grim anniversary this week, it was Joe Biden, not Vladimir Putin, striding through Kyiv on a sunny Monday morning. I thought it was important that the President of the United States be here the day the attack began. I thought it was critical that there not be any doubt, none whatsoever, about U.S. support for Ukraine in their war against the brutal attack by Russia. I think that is a historical moment for our, for our 
country and very important. Today we'll speak detail about the situation on the battlefield. But I think almost we'll speak about people, about Ukrainians, about Americans. Obviously for, for Vladimir Putin having the uh, the president of the United States uh, being in Ukraine just a few days before the anniversary is, of course, a very, very bad uh, signal. The White House says it informed Russian authorities hours ahead of Biden's visit. Anita Powell, VOA News, Washington. Russian forces have occupied and subsequently lost vast swaths of territory, but they appear to be regrouping for a new offensive. Families in areas under fire say they've already suffered enormous losses. VOA's Heather Murdoch takes us to the Kherson region in southern Ukraine. When it was occupied by Russia last year, this village, Pravdina, in the Kherson Oblast, was surrounded by the Ukrainian army and engaged in fierce fighting. The front line passed right here. The Russians stood here, all over the street. Much of the area has been destroyed or laden with mines, but Ukraine now controls the province. Dummies set up by Russian troops to scare Ukrainian forces now stand guard against no one. A reminder that on the ground, even high-tech war mostly consists of young men fighting to survive. This is the airport just outside the city of Kherson. The level of destruction here is breathtaking. Each side has attacked the airport multiple times. Both would rather see it in ruins than be useful to the enemy. Inside this provincial capital, street signs declare Kherson a hero city and say, family, you are free. Bombs still fall day and night, but most of the city still stands. Locals say the vast majority of residents fled long ago. Some escaped when Russia took over. Others left with the Russians when Ukraine took the city back. Russian forces are only a few kilometers away, and the people remaining say they have nowhere to go or they have been displaced from even more dangerous places. We have been here in Kherson for half a year and have only been to our home once. Now there is no road because the bridge was destroyed. Ignatenko is also from Pravdina, where most homes are empty or destroyed. There were many worse days here. We were fired upon many times. I fixed the windows over and over again before the house was destroyed. So there were many worse days here. The very worst day was when I saw Russian tanks entering the village. Now only remnants of Russian tanks remain in the village, but Sasanovich says that is little comfort when so much has been lost. And after a full year of war here in Ukraine, locals say that even if it ends tomorrow, the devastation here is enormous. Reporting from Kherson in Ukraine, Heather Murdoch, VOA News. February 24th marks the anniversary of Russian forces' attack on Ukraine as part of a mass-scale invasion. Analysts initially predicted it would be a matter of weeks, if not days, before Russia seized control of the capital, Kyiv. Few were prepared for the fierce Ukrainian resistance that followed, least of all Russian President Vladimir Putin. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky swiftly rejected an offer from the U.S. government to evacuate him, saying, the fight is here, I need ammunition, not a ride. He vowed to stay in Kyiv and declared martial law. The fog of war soon set in. More than 1.5 million Ukrainians became refugees within the first 10 days, after being forced to flee the country. Western nations, meanwhile, slapped Russian officials with a flurry of sanctions as they supplied Ukraine with billions of dollars in military aid and heavy artillery. By early March, Russian troops made quick advances in the south and east, entering the Kherson region and taking control of Europe's largest nuclear plant, located in the southeastern city of Zaporizhia. Russian forces also approached the outskirts of Kyiv, but quickly faced manpower shortages. In early April, journalists and human rights workers found extensive evidence of apparent war crimes committed in the town of Bucha, less than 20 miles northwest of Kyiv. They asserted that Russian troops deliberately targeted civilians. 
Hundreds of civilian bodies were uncovered after being found scattered across the streets and in communal graves. After the Bucha findings, U.S. President Joe Biden accused Russia of committing genocide in Ukraine. Putin, vowing to continue the war, ordered a new Russian offensive to take control of the Donbas. In May, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres doubled down on calls for Russia to end a war he said was senseless in its scope, ruthless in its dimensions, and limitless in its potential for global harm. Several days later, the US, G7, and EU agreed to impose a sweeping new round of sanctions against Russia, including a commitment to phase out most imports on Russian oil by the end of 2022. In another blow to Putin, Sweden and Finland unveiled formal bids to join NATO. Putin had previously cited fear of NATO expansion as one of the main reasons for Russia's invasion of Ukraine. As summer set in, Ukrainian forces made key strides with a string of counteroffensives. By September, Ukraine retook nearly all of the Kharkiv region and later recaptured the city of Lyman in Donetsk province. Russia, meanwhile, illegally annexed Donetsk, Kherson, Luhansk, and Zaporizhia on September 30th, significantly deepening Russian control in the east after its 2014 annexation of the entire Crimean Peninsula and occupation of areas of Luhansk and Donetsk. In October, an explosion severely damaged a bridge linking Russia with Crimea, the peninsula that was annexed by Russia in 2014. After accusing Ukraine of being behind the explosion, Russia retaliated by bombing Ukraine's energy infrastructure, destroying key plants and power grids ahead of winter. Ukraine celebrated another key victory in early November, when Russian forces retreated from the southern port city of Kherson, once home to 250,000 people. Another crisis was deepening in Europe as inflation hit double digits amid the fallout from the war. The Kremlin wagered that surging prices combined with new waves of Ukrainian refugees in Europe would strike a blow to European support for the war. However, a January 2023 Eurobarometer poll found that 74% of EU citizens still strongly approved of Europe's decision to provide support for Ukraine. A similar Ipsos poll from December 2022 found that the vast majority of Americans supported U.S. aid for Ukraine, but concerns lingered about its impact on American households. Nearly half of respondents said Ukraine should settle for peace as soon as possible, even if it meant losing some territory. A number of grim figures show the devastating cost of war as the one-year anniversary approaches. The UN estimates that some 7,000 civilians have been killed in Ukraine since February 2022. Senior Ukrainian officials estimate up to 13,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed in the last year. Russian officials say nearly 6,000 Russian troops have been killed in the same time period, though US intelligence officials say the number of Russian soldier deaths and injuries is much closer to 100,000. The OECD estimates the war will have cost the global economy $2.8 trillion in lost output by the end of next year. And the UN has recorded close to 8 million Ukrainian refugees across Europe alone. To many, the human and economic costs of the war may already seem extreme, but analysts remain uncertain as to how and when the conflict will end, with both sides determined to push forward. In response to Russia's war in Ukraine, the U.S. and NATO drastically ramped up defenses across Eastern Europe. This month, I gained exclusive access to U.S. soldiers in Estonia, preparing to defend NATO's edge should Moscow invade. They're the closest U.S. soldiers to Russia's border. Training with live fires in NATO ally Estonia on how to take turf from an enemy. The overall end state of this is the platoon seizing that key piece of terrain, which is that enemy trench line. Let's go, first squad, move! Let's go, let's go! U.S. soldiers with the 101st Airborne Division eliminate simulated enemy scouts and defenses. Fire in the hell, fire in the hell, fire in the hell! At a training site less than 50 kilometers from Russia. Alpha 2, move up! Which invaded its non-NATO neighbor, Ukraine, one year ago. And these are real case scenarios. You are seeing this play out on the battlefield in Ukraine. Yeah, with any type of training exercise, we want to provide the most realistic uh, training environment for our soldiers to better prepare them and our leaders uh, for any type of uh, challenges that are in the future. Through the breach, getting into the trench. Oh. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Okay, so they just reached the objective, but they're still taking on enemy fire. 
team leader Liz Versova trains the platoon's weapons on the open field ahead. Because we were expecting some enemy reinforcements, as well as a BMP-2, which is an infantry fighting vehicle. They take that out with an AT-4, a weapon similar to the Javelin anti-tank missiles knocking out real armored vehicles in Ukraine. Hey, target enemy. Full cycle. The enemy here is simulated, but the challenges are real. As soldiers used to desert warfare for the last 20 years, build a new type of readiness. A lot of the soldiers have not seen snow before in their entire lives, so being thrown into this environment can be challenging. About 200 kilometers northwest, American HIMARS, multiple rocket launchers with the 1st Infantry Division, stand guard, sentinels shrouded by pines. We can fire on the move, uh, stay in uh, hide positions and very uh, well concealed and covered locations for long periods of time. Once the fire mission is processed, in a matter of seconds, it's able to deliver its uh, rockets or a missile. These HIMARS and their operators arrived in December as part of the U.S. military's enhanced presence in the Baltics. At the beginning of last year, there were 600 American troops in the three Baltic nations. Now, there are about 1,500. So they've got a defense set up right here. Colonel Richard Ikenna commands the 1st Infantry Division's artillery forces. He says U.S. HIMARS operators have trained in Estonia before, but now it's different because they're also part of Estonia's collective defense for an extended period of time. We are in the scenario here. It really brings real time what is going on here in order to operate um, and to be as ready as possible. The HIMARS team provided long range firepower for this month's annual winter camp exercise involving hundreds of troops. This is how Estonia prepares for war, but because they're a member of NATO, they wouldn't go it alone and NATO allies are fully integrated into the exercise. Estonians defend trenches that French forces try to seize. British troops clear the way for Danish Leopard 2 tanks to punch through simulated defenses. Tanks similar to the ones soon to be seen on the Ukrainian battlefield. NATO allies hope the Leopards, along with Britain's Challenger 2 tanks, will give Ukrainians more power and protection than the Soviet-made tanks currently in the fight. The battles in the Ukraine will be slow, and what you need is you need a heavy tank, like Challenger, that can take a hit, uh, and uh, more so than a T-72, which will probably be destroyed after one round. Um, Challenger can take multiple hits and stay in the fight. But training Ukrainians to use these tanks effectively won't happen overnight. Well, tanks are much weighted, we know that, and, and uh, I really hope that we are just not too late for that. Uh, Russia still have, even they have lost more than 2,000 tanks. They still have thousands of tanks in the stocks they can bring to Ukraine. They still have uh, missiles, they still have rockets, which means that, of course, Ukraine needs as much help as we, as we can give. Estonia's defense minister tells VOA his country has spent 1% of its entire GDP supporting Ukraine and nearly 3% of GDP on self-defense. We have a clear understanding that every tank destroyed in Ukraine is one tank less behind our border. How worried are you that Russia could attack here? Well, we have to be ready. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, we are like the front door of NATO. And when the front door is locked, then it's safe to be inside of the house. So, so simple is that. A message NATO allies have taken to heart as increased defenses pour in. Several reporters have been killed or seriously injured during the first year of this war. From Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, VOA's Heather Murdoch shows us what it's like to cover Russia's war on Ukraine in today's Press Freedom Spotlight. Over the past year, thousands of foreign journalists have come from all over the world to cover the war in Ukraine. Ukrainian journalists also traveled into battle zones instantly shifting their positions from beat reporters to frontline correspondents. More than a dozen journalists have been killed out on assignment, and many others were seriously injured. Veteran correspondents say the war is like none other in recent memory. Um, I, was, I was down in Bakhmut and Solodar about two weeks ago, and, and to be honest, it, it, was the most, it was the most what I'd imagine World War II was, com compared to where, you know, a lot of the, the wars I covered are civil wars and 
small groups of rebels fighting the army, but this, this was like total, total war, you know, very, very heavy artillery. The conflict has brought large numbers of freelancers to Ukraine. Eager young journalists can make a name for themselves in war zones, but lack of preparation can be deadly. The Frontline Club and other media support groups, like the Lviv Press Freedom Center in western Ukraine, are attempting to mitigate the risks. We can provide them with a vest, with a helmets, with a medical kits. Also, we're helping them building capability by providing them some trainings. But there is no way to prevent all field injuries or deaths, no matter how well trained the journalists are. And some say it's worth the risk. There is no really safe way to be in the war, especially in this safe war, because this war in, is brutal. And uh, there are casualties, uh, civilians uh, and their houses are shot by like missiles. People... Like many Ukrainian journalists, Hilchelko sees his work as part of the war effort. In general, the goal of journalism is to present neutral information in conflict. But Hilchelko says he believes that keeping the outside world informed about the suffering of civilians inside Ukraine could be important for their survival as a nation. Heather Murdoch, VOA News, Kyiv, Ukraine. And now a closer look at the human cost of this war. Vitaly Antonchuk was a soldier in the Ukrainian army who died in May during a Russian missile strike in the Zaporizhia region. He left behind his wife, Yulia, and their six-year-old daughter, Alisa. I met them in Warsaw, Poland, where they fled to escape the war. It was an incomprehensible connection. We watched each other grow up. After graduating from college, Yulia and Vitaly got married. He joined the army. She started teaching. And then came Alisa. He always talked to Elisa the whole period while she was in my tummy. He said that she would have eyes like his, lips like mine. He taught her to be sporty, to ride a bicycle. He had no other hobby. And he was always little Elisa's protector. He was kind. He supported me. He hugged me all the time, played with me and taught me how to fight. <laughs> but their family was ripped apart when Russia invaded Ukraine. This is the last photo they ever took together. Yulia fled with Elisa here to Warsaw. But not long after, Vitaly was killed in a missile strike. Alisa, too young to fully comprehend this war, has taken the loss hard. She began to draw pictures where Vitali is no longer standing next to us, where he is above us. And when she asked me if he would come back, I had to say no. It was very difficult. Yulia and Alisa both seek counseling at Warsaw's UN Refugee Agency Center. Alisa gets to play there with other Ukrainians and talk to kids who speak her language. They're supported by a foundation called Children of Heroes, a charity that aids Ukrainian children who have lost one or both parents in the war. There is between 20 and 50,000 children in this situation right now. Uh, as of today, we have uh, 3,488 children uh, under our support programs, and we are adding 50 children per day. Yulia says this war has turned their future, once so bright, into something painful without Vitaly. You're still wearing your wedding ring, aren't you? Doc. Yes, because I'm not ready to let him go. She says her main focus is keeping Alisa's happy memories of Vitaly in her heart, in hopes they can soon return to the homeland he died fighting for. What a sad situation. For more information on how to support families like Yulia and Alisa, visit our website at voanews.com. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at VOA News and catch up on past episodes with our free streaming service, VOA Plus. We'll have more from Ukraine next week on The Inside Story.